Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Dahi O'Kelly, and I'm chair of the UK group in the Institute. It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you here uh, to this webinar with the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, Dr. Steve Aitken. Um, Steve will talk to us for about 20 minutes, and that will be followed then by a uh, question and answer session. If you have a, a question, uh, please uh, use the question and answer function button uh, on the Zoom. Um, may I remind you that <clears throat> today's session, uh, both the uh, preliminary chat and the question and answer session uh, is on the record. And please feel free uh, during the discussion uh, to use Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, I first came to know Steve Aiken when he was the Chief Executive Officer of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, and he was the first such person. He ran it for a period of over three years, and by the time he left it, uh, it was an organization which was working exceedingly well and was good for both Britain uh, and for Ireland. He's had a, a very distinguished uh, career. Uh, he spent approximately 30 years uh, in the British uh, Naval Forces uh, and commanded a number of nuclear uh, submarines. So he knows what it's like to have his finger uh, on the button. He worked for the UK Ministry of Defence's Global Strategic Trends Programme uh, and um, he has a PhD uh, and an MPhil uh, from the University of Cambridge, as well as an MA from King's College, uh, London. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Steve here this afternoon uh, and to make his acquaintance again, because I greatly enjoyed meeting with him when he was in Dublin. Steve, over to you. Uh, Dahi, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to the IIEA for inviting me along. And uh, I should never start a sort of a briefing with an apology, but it, since this is about my sixth or seventh Zoom uh, call on today, I just wanted to make sure that I don't sound as if I'm coming across as being uh, too Zoomed out. And I might have to look down and occasionally look at my notes as I go through. What I thought I would do is I'll give you some introductory remarks and then open up to any questions and obviously to be fully sort of invigilated and uh, run by Dahi and the rest of it. But my overall point, and I go back to a time when I thought British-Irish relations were very much on the up. And that was when I had the opportunity when I was chair, of, or as, as I was the chief executive of the British-Irish Chamber of Commerce, we were in Windsor Castle and I was being presented to the President Higgins and also to Her Majesty. And at that event in Windsor Castle, there was everybody from across these islands. And what I thought was, here we are. This is the way ahead. This is the future for these islands. This is the future for these relationships from these islands. And as I walked out of Windsor Castle that evening, feeling uh, quite merry, and indeed having enjoyed the hospitality of both the British and Irish governments to a considerable degree, I just said to myself, what could possibly go wrong? And uh, that will probably be part of the subject of the talks of the conversation that I go through at the moment. But sort of, I'll just, I'll just crack on into this and I apologize if I'm looking down just at a few bits and pieces because uh, this is the way we're doing it. But uh, 2021 is already shaping up to be a momentous year and it hasn't even arrived yet. To set the context, we will be for better or worse over the transition period and the United Kingdom, which lest we all forget Northern Ireland is part of, will have left the European Union. COVID will not only be still with us, we could be dealing with another gathering wave of the disease, but the fear of the virus, coupled with a significant and continuing global economic downturn, will further add to the depression that many economic systems are suffering from, and unfortunately will continue to suffer from. We will have, no matter what, an increasingly protectionist administration in the United States, no matter who gets the presidency. Climate change will be contributing to continued security challenges on energy, on migration, on food supply, and indeed the physical disruption caused by extreme weather events. Coupled to this, the continued diffusion of hegemonic power, 
between the West to the East and the rising instability in the Middle and Near East shows that stability and certainty will be in very short supply. On this island, we're off trammeled into seeing things at the purely local, nay indeed virtually street by street or townland. But that does us all, British, Irish, European, planter or gale, a disservice. Because these islands, and note the position of the apostrophe, do belong firmly in the globalised world, and all of our horizons are and should continue to be on a much, much broader level. Also, on a plus point, Northern Ireland, despite a near century of attempts to see its demise, enters our second century. And although, speaking as a unionist, we would have preferred that the Republic of Ireland had remained part of the United Kingdom, we're more than happy to commemorate our past and to celebrate our next 100 years. Indeed, that, coupled with the very uncertainty and instability mentioned in the paragraphs just before that, brings a dynamic to relationships across these islands that we must consider. And that is why I say we need to urgently consider a reset. And it's in the context that these remarks are made. To say the least, to paraphrase another leader, who may or may not have been Boris Yeltsin, if asked to expand on the current state of relations on these islands in one word, would be, I'm afraid, the word bad. In two words, appallingly bad. I'd like to go back to the halcyon days of Windsor Castle of 2011 and 2014, when Anglo-Irish Anglo relations had reached what we had hoped was the start of a new and respectful relationship. We had now, in more than one way, seen much of this precious goodwill has actually begin, has dissolved. To paraphrase the next, another ex-diplomat who I admire, Bobby McDonough, when he wrote in the, re the recent issue of the uh, re-established Fortnight magazine in Belfast, that there has been irritation and at some time that's sometimes spilled into anger about Ireland's view of what's been happening in Britain. And I say this as a friend, and from a very friendly British and unionist perspective, that irritation and anger towards Irish politicians and officials has grown from our side. And indeed, we have invented a new word for it. We call it union splaining. That very annoying and patronizing habit of talking about unionists, about how they should be thinking about their union without actually talking to any unionists. And this normally, believe it or not, occurs in platforms when unionists are actually present. But again, we're never ever asked. And it's a phenomenon that unfortunately is closely related to Brit splitting, which Finson O'Toole has become rather adept at. But here is the reality that the United Kingdom as a whole, because that is what democracy is about, voted as a whole to leave the EU. And this is an example of the democratic choice of the British people. That it was a bad choice, and as a remainer, I believed it was a terrible choice, can be many people's opinion. And it's fair to say that many listening today will agree with me in this. However, it clearly has been ratified by general election results and vote in our parliament and is now the direction and course of travel we are following. In the words of a famous American general, excrement happens. Time to get over it and move on. But this will have irrevocable implications, especially around trade and future relationships is an immutable fact. But an insistence on a form of an Irish version of Schadenfreude does no one any good. And I'll let you into a fact about the British system based, of course, on being British and having been a key part of that establishment for well over three decades, is that much of Britain has moved on. Brexit is done. And both of the main political parties have not only accepted that, they now see that there's no appetite to revisit the debate. And a part of that price of putting barriers in the way of an Irish land bridge, stopping EU fishing vessels from taking the same level of catch that they had before, undercutting the European banking and finance industry, aiding UK research, strip, research and development to drive growth, or even accepting WT tr trade rules. That is what unfortunately is going to happen. All these issues will have consequences, but the United Kingdom will, having probably tried everything else, will make it work. It might look like muddling through, but the end of it, the UK will still be the sixth or seventh largest economy, still be in the top five of the global soft powers, a member of the P5, and whereas the, whereas the opinion pages of the Irish Times still decry Little England, 
it still possesses a significant amount, amounts of hard and soft power, or as Joseph and I would say, smart power, power that Europe and the US will still need for its wider security considerations in a very, very uncertain world. And add to this context, you can't change geography. On these islands, there's a combined population of over 70 million. We are and continue to be interconnected, interdependent and integrated. And as much as you may wish you were an island without perfidious Albion 20 miles away next door, or that 1 million odd citizens of this island remain proudly British and are going to remain so, we have to learn with the reality and to make it work. For after all, regrettably, we're now in the era of self-interest rather than global friendships. And COVID is also a defining moment. Years ago, when I worked for the United Kingdom's Minister of Defence in the Global Strategic, Strategic, I'll say that again, Global Strategic Trends Programme, one of the biggest risks was a global pandemic, the effects of which we magnified by globalisation and the interconnectivity of the global economy. When we looked at it in 2009, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. That the economic world of just enough, just in time, relying on the robust conduits of global trade sinews, powered by large volumes of workers, could be so quickly disrupted, was again a factor well known. That this had been modelled and largely understood has been translated into a fearful and sometimes disjointed global response to the pandemic. But we can also see the contours of a rising epidemiological nationalism. Previously, restrictions and movements of people was largely based on the control of economic migration. Now, and increasingly, it's going to be about biosecurity. We're also seeing the rise of protectionist barriers to retain national capabilities, security of key medical devices, and as the intersection of COVID and climate change, securing and defending food supplies. When COVID subsides, which it will, the international system will be much more wary, more protective, and less willing to share for the international and common good. That this is occurring during a period of hegemonic transition should be a worry for us all. So given this, and I haven't yet mentioned the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol, or that much hated border down the middle of the Irish Sea, that is why the need for reset of as much greater consequence than just an issue of North-South relations. For Ireland, we need you to do well. We want the Republic to be a successful and vibrant country. That is a beacon of Atlanticism in an increasingly Eurocentric EU. We want to see investment in Irish universities, in research and development, and we want you to be able to provide a sheltered spot for US invest investment in a, a place which is basically in Europe is rapidly becoming anti-American and anti-American uh, economic as well. We want you to sort out issues around homelessness, create an equivalent to the National Health Service, do something about the Dublin-centric central approval pull of the M50. And for me, I'm delighted that the Taoiseach announced that there would be close on 500 million in stuff to, do, to issues to do on a shared on a shared island. We'd be delighted if we could have 200 million of that to help build the A5 road and also do something about the narrow water bridge. But to my many, many friends in Ireland, I want to see you succeed. And that with you paying Scandinavian rates of taxation, you at least get Danish levels of hoogie service. In short, as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party and as a personal friend, I hope you find a way to do it. And, and for those who also believe in the union, we want to be your friends. We just don't want to be part of you. We also, as the Ulster Unionist Party, the party that quite frankly self-immolated itself on the creation of the Belfast Agreement, we do not accept the current rhetoric on any side that has helped the stability of Northern Ireland one iota. Telling those that the Belfast Agreement is under threat from a north-south border while ignoring the very severe implications of checks on the Irish Sea is at best disingenuous. At worst, from our community's perspective, inflammatory. So, how do we get from bad to, if not good, acceptable? I have a few proposals. The first is to accept that Brexit has happened and having happened, Stop demonising the British people for the decision that they made. Whether you like it or not, and I accept many don't, we all have to collectively get on with it. 
And please remember that whereas in my hometown of Ballyclare, there are many people who take a regular offence at remarks made by certain Irish government ministers. Quite frankly, in London, Swindon and beyond, they don't care. They're not interested. Given that, please have a serious internal debate about what relationship you want with the UK. A bit of the UK that's just to the north of you and the great big island to the east of you. Do you want to create an enmity with your neighbour that, to be fairly honest, treats this island today with a largely benign feeling? Or do you want to rile it so it decides in its own interests to treat you, for instance, like some form of far or other eastern country? I was going to use the word Russia here, but they'll probably hack the, the link if they do it at that stage. What is the future relationship you actually want? I surmise that getting back to the days of 2011 and 2014 is probably beyond the current political lance leadership on either side of the RSC. But at least, and I hope it is something that we want to, it's something we need to aim for. Looking at the post-COVID landscape, sharing lessons identified, creating common supply chains, setting up a post-pandemic research groups amongst our universities, joint purchasing of vaccines, utilizing the strong links created between our health minister, the rest of the UK and the Republic can help rebuild trust in both our experts, which we need to do, and our political class. And let's use the Belfast Agreement. It's there and use it in all its parts. But use the sections of the North, South and East, West relationships. Don't go around creating new structures and expect at least the political unionist uh, community to buy into another additional layer, especially when there's been no recognition of any genuine concern, concerns shown to my community by the abuse of the agreement as a bargaining chip in the febrile destructive EU and UK negotiations. And as a point of goodwill, actually commit to the lightest touch of regulation in Northern Ireland, paying more in Asda's and Tesco's for goods that, than the, that we should be paying for and paying more for them than what we're paying for now that we would be in Scotland, Wales or England. That is not going to go down well with the people of Northern Ireland. We want to have a level UK playing field. And the one that indeed, that lightest touch will assuage the people of Northern Ireland about the benign intent of both the EU and the Irish government than any rhetoric coming from Brussels or indeed from IB House. And if there are any new structures we need, let's have a Council of the Isles, not working towards a shared island, but a shared islands approach. And again, come and join us in our celebrations, commemorations of our next 100 years. Hopefully we'll be in Dublin anyhow, celebrating Northern Ireland representing this island in the Euros. And I expect that I'll be really looking forward to be doing that as well. Come on, Northern Ireland. But in the spirit that we helped mark the 1916 centenary in Dublin, please respect our commemorations and our celebrations, but also use it as an opportunity to start a dialogue about recognizing the current settlement that is the status quo, but maybe indeed is the status quo, it might be the best way for us all to go forward. And as such, how can we enhance it for the good of everybody? Dahi, thank you very much indeed. I've wittered on there by my clock for just under 19 minutes. So I'll give you a moment of time, but thank you very much indeed for listening to me and please open to any questions. Thank you.